uh, we could serialize the rows in a binary encoding. So if we define, this is a five by five grid. So one way to think about it would be uh, a multidimensional array where uh, each row is an array with five values. So we would say zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And then second row, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. One, zero and zero one zero one zero one zero 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 one so we could do it like a two-dimensional array or we could just serialize it completely and convert this icon to zero zero one zero 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 one zero one zero zero one zero one zero zero one zero one zero one zero 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 one And so what if we interpreted this binary value uh, into a number? So we could use a, uh, we could use a binary converter of our choice. Um, uh, unit computer. Where did it go? Uh, base conversion, that's what I want. So we could say, oh no, look, it died. It's base conversion died binary to hex converter. So we could enter this. And see hex. So that's your personalized number. So your ID number could be in hex um, for five two nine five one and if everyone's picture is unique then suddenly uh, we've personalized your number uh, which is which is kind of neat now that's just the beginning so then we try to figure out well how does a computer uh, wh what does that actually mean to store and move this number around well the computer is always going to ultimately deal with everything as a series. So we, we tried to act this out. And so I'm going to spool the video up and you'll get to see what we attempted at West Hills. Um, and uh, this was our second pass. So what we're seeing is we took the sequence of bits for an icon and we serialized it onto a tape of ones and zeros and we strung it down from the second floor in the atrium, eight bits at a time, and oh, no. then transferred it on eight bit oh, buffers no. Our software, we have a <laughs> over to a laptop and attempted to reconstruct uh, the icon. So here's the, these are the bits coming in as if it were being read into a hard drive. And so Mark's job was to transfer it to a buffer to move across the motherboard. And then we simulated sending it to a program that would then try to turn it back into an icon. So the, um, we would say that this, our hard drive was about three bits per second or something. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe five, two or three bits per second. Um, and what uh, our first attempt actually didn't turn out all that poorly. So here's um, after 
uh, the original icon that we were attempting to encode looked like this, and I put it on our, um, so jump down to Python 2 schedule. Um, I gave you a link. So our project is here under icon manipulation module. So the first, um, that was one of the students' icons. I think this was, where's the one we did? Okay, so I don't, I don't have the original, but here we were only off by, so the buffer moved over, that's the 8-bit buffer. And so then we had a student design a GUI program uh, that takes in a series of ones and zeros, the serial bit of the icon. And if entered correctly, if all the, the hardware, human hardware bits work, uh, it gets reconstructed into uh, the original icon. And so we only were off by one bit. Uh, that bit was off, that little one on the bottom, but all the others were, were transferred correctly. Um, so kind of a, a, a neat little exercise for computer fundamentals and it was kind of fun to build. I think I have a better shot. Here it is going up to the second floor. Um, so the idea would be that the people on the top floor, can own, they can't talk to the people on the second floor. You've just got a wire and you only can send pluses and ones and zeros down the wire uh, <laughs> and, and figure out how to get the computer on the bottom to process what the computer on the top gave you. Um, so this was uh, the inspiration to try to get classes to, um, I thought, how can we get classes to work together and, and, and collaborate? So I designed this project that is gonna invite you to write in Python a tool that can take in a string of uh, ones and zeros, or uh, the actual specs say that um, you can take in the on and off and whatever whatever format makes sense, but you need to expect to have a uh, hundred values, meaning a ten by ten icon. Um, and our goal is to create a program that can use looping and basic data structures to display the icon in the console. And the the next challenge will be to figure out if you can then manipulate them. Uh, can you rotate the icon? Uh, can you transform it? Could you scale it so that each pixel is represented not by one letter, but by a 10 by 10 block of letters? Um, and I found this to be uh, a really good head cruncher uh, of a project. So what I've written up is uh, a set of uh, requirements for you to start chewing on. Um, and I'll demo a little bit together tonight in Python to get, get you going. Um, if you feel good, then you can uh, zoom off and give it a try. But what I did was um, came up with a couple of basic requirements. So create a data structure, and you can choose the one that's most appropriate, list, tuple dictionary that can represent the sequence of off cells and on cells inside Python. Um, and then your second requirement is read your custom data structure to display a visual representation of your icon using a single symbol, like an asterisk. Um, so you've seen the idea of, of ASCII art where you can make images with only characters. Uh, this is ASCII art in Python. Um, and then uh, we'll see how far. If you can make it to requirement three, that's cool. This is not, this is a little tricky. So can you implement one or more transformations on a given icon, starting with scaling, such that each cell is represented not by one character, but a square of characters of a given size? Consider other transformations, such as inverting on and off cells, um, so taking the negative or rotating it. I've never had anyone do an arbitrary set of degrees that could be, um, that's a beast. Um, and then uh, I want you to think about it as, I wanna see how you do with uh, writing in as many sensible functions as possible. So we wanna get away from a huge long script that is unmaintainable, uh, but rather what are the individual tasks that you might need to do uh, and put those in a function. Um, and now, uh, for sharing, I need to edit this. 
So I don't want you to send me an email. I'd like you to just post it on your GitHub that I'd like you to get set up. So post your code on your GitHub account um, and make sure your Git account is linked in our uh, shared tracker. Okay, so what I mean by that is um, part of your to-do for the week will be um, start in thinking about your plan for your icon project. Uh, I want to make sure you have a Git tutorial or a, a Git account set up. And did I not save that? And we want to try posting there. Let's see. I think this will update it now. Good. Okay. So over on your out of class work, um, there's a link right here for Git repos and project tracker. There is also that same link is located uh, right here. So that will pull up a Google Doc. And you can see Loretta's already on top of, up top of her game. Um, so put your uh, public ID and then just paste in your uh, GitHub once you've got it set up. I encourage you to make a new one for Python 2. Um, and I have instructions for setting up Git linked in the schedule as well. In fact, I have a really good tutorial now. So um, I have an entire hour and 20 minutes of me talking about Git, which we'll work through together. But if you just need help setting up your account, um, I have a screen by screen shot of how to set up an account if you don't have one already. Um, so ultimately, this project is it's all in the command line. Just remember that, that we're dealing with characters and looping. I'm not asking you to go into GUI land and make some fancy thing. I want you to think about loops and data structures which is what our workhorse is going to be for the rest of the term. Um, so let's, um, I'll stop for questions and then uh, I'll try doing a little sketching. I'd like you to include in your Git repo some form of uh, documentation of your planning efforts. Hang on, I'm trying not to destroy my cameras. So this is your first little project. Um, questions so far on, on what this is about? I deliberately didn't put screenshots of people's projects from last term. Uh, and I encourage you not to. Uh, you could look through all their repos and you could see some great examples, which I want you to do when you've done your example. Um, because there's, there's some interesting creative stuff out there. Um, a, good, a good project starts with some plan. And for those of you feeling like, oh, well, I don't know where to start, um, the, the coding mantra of solve the absolute simplest problem you can first. So if, if you're feeling like, wow, there's a lot of steps to this, let's make a little flow diagram of what are the, uh, let's think about the simplest program that doesn't meet the requirements, but gives me something to build on. Right. So it's like, well, start with a, if you're making a song, you know, start with a scale that sounds interesting and, and then from there start finding chords and that kind of thing. So what's the first thing the program's going to need to do? Well, you might even start um, by hard coding a data structure that represents a, uh, a sequence of bits for an icon. Um, so maybe the first step is you say, okay, well, I'm, I've got tuples, lists, Dictionaries, uh, this seems like a, you know, maybe we'll start with a, a list of a sequence of ones and zeros. And uh, can I print out onto the screen a, uh, can, I, can I loop through that list? And for each one that, for each zero, I print two spaces. For each one, I print two stars. So think about a, a very a very simple flow. So uh, I might say uh, create hard coded binary sequence, and then 
write a function that displays uh, a list of one or zero on screen. So that could be the absolute simplest program. Make a data structure and loop over it. And then you can start getting more complicated. So when you can get a hard-coded thing to work, then you need a function that asks user for sequence. What I want you to imagine is if COVID leaves us and we can go back to in-person meeting, imagine my CIT 115s and they've got this ribbon of ones and zeros coming down and they're sitting at a keyboard and when they see a, a one, they type one and when they see a zero, they type a zero. So think about an interface that could actually be used by other students for uh, learning about computers through your Python program. Um, so ask the user for sequence displays a list of zero or one on the screen. Um, so once you can get some basic user input and display it, uh, maybe then the next thing is you pass it to a function that uh, scales the list uh, by some factor. So I'm imagining a function like um, def uh, scale icon uh, in which you give it uh, maybe two inputs. You give it a, a list. So you could say uh, maybe you call it binary list. And then you give it an integer for the scale factor. So maybe you give it 10, in which case every one will turn into a 10 by 10 grid of some character and every zero turns into a 10 by 10 grid of spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the scale value, so then you can see that you could start building out a simple user interface that says, you know, how much do you want to scale it by? Ask for the sequence, read that into a list, then ask the user, how do you want me to display this? Scale by what? Uh, and so then instead of hard coding a 10, you could have a simple function that gets, gets scale factor from user and send that in as a variable instead of a hard coded value. Um, so this is the way I would start is getting some paper and think about what those key functions might be. Yeah, I, I'm not, uh, I used to think that we needed a really rigid approach for flowcharting, but what, I, what we really want is I want you to come up with a way to think about the flow of the program between functions. Um, and sometimes simple boxes and arrows can, can do the trick. Um, so I'm going to stop talking for a minute and let some things settle in, see if you've got some clarifying questions. And then if you want, I can, can fire up the interpreter and tinker with some loops. That would be helpful. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So it's just so going to be the play, play of, of tech, tech, basically. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So we would, we could imagine a, uh, this icon, if we were to display it on, from our program would be, let's use a scale factor of, of four. So I'm going to, if we did, uh, underscores for spaces, we would have uh, and then and that would scale up to a small square of four x's. Oh, sorry.
So that that's the idea. Yeah, um, yeah. And so you could you can start with the simplest hard coded values where you choose what zeros become and you choose what ones become. I've had students that got all fired up and had the user design the whole thing. What do you what do you want as input? So you could choose which keys you use to input it and it would convert that into, uh, I've had students, instead of using ones and zeros, they use true false values, which could be quite handy for controlling loops. So maybe you choose to make a list of 100 Boolean values. Off, off, on, off, off, true, or false, false, true, false, 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 true, false, true, false. Um, some things that you'll need to consider is, uh, do you want? How do you want to deal with the line breaks? Uh, do you want to have five? You could have a list of lists, so you could have a list in which each embedded list corresponds to a single row. Uh, that's a uh, a less computer-like way to do it. A more computer-like way might be keep it as a serial string of 100 bits, and then you input the row size. Mm -hmm. And so it knows to count to the end of the row, and then it puts a line return, and then it keeps going, uh, in which case the original data structure doesn't have any idea uh, that it's storing 10 different rows. It just knows it's storing 100 values, and your interpreting function knows how to chop at a fixed number of characters. Um, so there's some interesting, there's a lot of design possibilities to get your brain going. Um, and I think this pertains a lot to data uh, handling because you're almost always getting data in a, in a format that's probably most convenient for gathering or entry. And that's often not the most ideal form for processing or display or analytics. Um, and this gives you a chance to get down to some nitty gritty stuff like line size and looping. Um, so let's, let's look in your book for where's the, where's the best looping section? Where's all the four stuff? So like section 3.8, um, the four statement. Loop 85, page 85. While and for. Uh, questions that come to mind so far? I know we're coming to the end of uh, a pretty heavy night. Can you please, Can you please uh, showcase, uh, showcase the, uh, uh, the demo, please? Oh, yeah. Do you want to do some Python? Let's write some Python. Um, so one of the things, because I spend so much time in compiled land, um, I've been trying to do more in the, in the interactive interpreter because it's, it's kind of a refreshing thing to be able to just tinker. So let's, um, let's try sketching out some stuff. If you feel good, uh, and you just gotta gotta go your way. Feel free to sign out. Um, what I'd like you to do is come next week with with something, um, meaning a program that can read something in and spit something out. And I want to talk to you about how that went and take a look at your code. And we'll do a little bit of peer analysis around functional design. So my requirement to build functions as distinct chunks of code. Uh, that's requirement um, four. That's an important design consideration, um, and so I'm gonna walk. I'm gonna help us through that. So, um, so that that's it for the evening, and then I'll just jump into some Python and we'll try some sketching, shall we? Okay. All right. Uh, let me make this a bit bigger. Uh,
And I should mention for those of you that are new, I hope this is a given for those of you that aren't, that if these projects seem irrelevant or you want to come up with something else, you know, just call me up and we'll come up with something new. Um, so let's, uh, hi Python, let's let's see how you're doing. So we've got Python, Python uh, 3.8 sitting here. Um, so I would, I'm just gonna start with, uh, let's, let's do, let's think about binary first. So let's call, let's make a list, sample list. Uh, so I'll call it uh, binary B sequence. And let's just make a list of, uh, let's think about a, let's do a three by three uh, icon for starters. So I'll make like a, a let's make a plus. So zero, one, zero, uh, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yep, like that. Okay, so we made a list, and let's let's try to get this thing to chop the list uh, at. So if I'm making a three by three, so I'll make a, let's make a variable called row size equals three. Uh, and so what I'm now thinking about is I want. If I think about a printer, that I've got a cursor that's going to print out on the console, and I want it, I want to be able to say, value, 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 and then I want to move it to the next line and say, value, 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 and then I want to move it to the next line and say, value, value, value. Um, so at the most basic level, we can let's let's just try tinkering a bit. So we could say for uh, v in our binary sequence um, print v. So let's just let's just get it out. Uh, what do we? Oh, sorry. All right, well, so much for the interpreter. What are you using right now? I'm just using Sublime Text, my basic go-to editor. So for value in B sequence, I can turn on Python. Uh, so we'll start by printing out value. We'll call this okay, and then we'll come over here and say exit okay so look what we got we got a a new line got printed after each print so we can tinker with that and instead say and uh, don't put a new line in there Uh, and then we'll put a new line at the end for good measure. Okay, so we got a little, we got everything out in a row. So now how do we start chopping that at every three? Ideas? You could use a, use a counter. counter. Yep. How would you think about that? Mm. 
Well, in in the the loop, every time you do a you read a value, you would put the at at one counter when counter equals three, then you would put in the 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 new uh, return carriage. Yeah, perfect. So uh, we're we're gonna have the idea of uh, we could do uh, a nested loop. Uh, one idea is. Uh, a hard-coded way to do it would be, well, let's keep that at three, uh, so we could say for um, uh, for position in range from zero to two, And then when it's done with that, then we print our new line. So this should count zero, one, two, and then break out of the loop. So let's try that. Uh, I forget the Python land of syntactical formatting is a weird thing. Wait, what are you so unhappy about? Would the second the print need to go over? Which one? Uh, the second, second one in the fourth. Here, on which line? I think six. I was thinking that should be at the same indent as this four. Okay, now I think it was unhappy. I was using tab instead of space and it gets kind of picky about that. Okay, so we got only two per line. Okay, there's three per line. I forget that the range is exclusive of the upper bound. These are just things you mis get mistakes on. So see how we're kind of building out the tool. I want you to start with the absolute simplest kind of situation. Now this is all in one function. So let's think about how we would break this up uh, into functions instead of just being uh, sloppy about it. So if we say, um, let, oh. if we run, um, how would we think about breaking this up? If we look back at our a diagram. I'm gonna let's go to the function chapter and just make sure that we're grounded in all of that. Uh, even sometimes in Java, if I'm using simple things, I'll pull up my big manual and, and discover, um, rediscover things that I, I may not have remembered. So let's start by just defining what we said on the board. So if we say uh, def uh, create uh, binary sequence and we can uh, we could make the binary sequence global so that everyone can get at it uh, that's an option uh, if we say binary sequence let's start with our globals so global B seek, and then forget. I've got to use spaces. I never, never global something. something. So yeah, global is allows us to have a variable in in scope that can be accessed by uh, any function. So and there's my Java coming back. Um, so. Uh, 
we want Okay, so we declare that and then um, so access to V sequence, we then initialize it there. And then what else do we need? So then what if we make function that is uh, display matrix in this case. And this, these can all be unique to that. Push those in. And so because bseq is a global, we should be able to get it there uh, as well. So do you remember how we um, how we work with functions? What's the function that we need to get this uh, to run happily? You need a main, need a main function. function. Yes, you definitely need a main function. And so that is our, you know, that uses our. Um, where, are where are we calling the, the, uh, uh, the, the function from like, um, I'm, I guess I, I just set up set stuff differently, with, with, so, so I'm, I'm just kind of figuring, figuring my way through this. Yeah, I'm I'm with you there. Uh, we're gonna make our standard main function. I'm looking for my uh, my reference. It's from the so main. You have, you have to call, to call the, the like the, the create, create binary, binary sequence, sequence and display and matrix. Exactly, and so we're gonna do that with. Hold on one sec. Connect. Okay, so we'll define our uh, our main and from here we'll call uh, create binary sequence and then display matrix and then how do we get the main to run automatically? We have to use the magic function there's uh, not another main. Yeah, so we have to say we have to use the the magic name if that equals main, then we automatically call main. Oh, there's my Java semicolon again. Oh, look at all of them. Oh, I would be laughed out of town. Oh geez, three different languages. This is gonna you're gonna have to be really patient with me on a Wednesday night after six other semicolon filled classes um so but this is this is a a mechanism that the python interpreter uses to say if we've got a function called main or if if the this name is is a reference to the place we can start the script and so what this will do is it will call main automatically when we run the script and then from main, it will run these other functions. So let's see if we can get that to go. Where did you go? I didn't like my global. Uh, am I spelling you right? Do you need to start it as an empty? I, 
I wonder Foul if, first? Yeah, I'm thinking a I minute mean, I've needed the global there. Go ahead. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, so I'm thinking that we did not get our V sequence loaded correctly. Okay, so that I think I may have so in this case, we will just define that in the general global scope. On this printing icon. Okay, so now let's debug. So we're getting this extra return in there. So we don't get that last one. I wanna check my magic, uh, my return. I'm getting a line feed and a carriage return in there. I'm going to chapter eight for strings, a deeper look. There it is. Line, the the backslash n gives you, uh, basically, it drops to a new line and then it hits enter. So you can see I've got. Now what happened here? Zero one. This isn't quite what I want because I'm getting the same character three times, and then it moves to a new line. But this is this is the start. This is what I want you to start tinkering with. Is start with your get your loops and your fours organized so that you have this idea. I would encourage you to think of one for loop gives you horizontal, uh, and then one loop is controlling when you move down. So I would start rearranging this, but I, I don't want to take the fun away from you. Um, um. What does it mean if underscore underscore name equals main? This is uh, so built into the interpreter. When it runs a script, it will um, it will ask, "Do I have a um, have I defined this uh, entity called name?" And if name is equal to this special identifier of main that's saying, I need you to call a function for me to start off this entire process. And so under the condition that this is in fact true, which is built into the interpreter, meaning it can call a function called main by itself, then it conducts whatever is inside this if, which is get main to go. That's a very poor explanation. Um, let's look up what name is actually called. Um, 
it has a special name. <coughs> the module's name is set equal to main when read from the standard input a script or interactive prompt um, top level script environment. The module can discover whether or not it's running in the main scope by checking its own name, which allows a common idiom for conditionally executing code in a module when it is run as a script or with python.m, but when it's not imported. Um, oh. so, so that's, it's a, it's, a, it's a way for giving an interpreter instructions for how to work your script. Uh, and let me, uh, I will chat that link out, um, main documentation. You know, it's more difficult to read documentation than yeah. it is to just look at code and basically understand what's going on. That, that is often the case. Um, but an, uh, what turns out is you're limited by what the script writer knew yeah. uh, without looking at the documentation. So. So you're right, there's, there's many ways to absorb Python. I learned a lot of Python from working with someone who'd been coding it every day for three years and it just came out of him. Um, and, and so I, I, I agree with you there. Um, Is there an advantage to using the if name equals main rather than just the main? Um, well, there's no, what this is doing is it's, the interpreter is calling main for you. So when I run it in, in the script here in my, in my, uh, when I send it to Python three, the program, it says, all right, what am I supposed to do with this? There has to be someone that starts the first domino, so to speak. So from a scripting standpoint, um, this entry is required. If you're going to run, if you want your program to function like a program that lives inside a single script, um, if you were running in Jupyter Notebook, you are working in a different kind of environment where each cell is giving the interpreter a specific instruction for something to do, whereas this script is being interpreted as an entire file and being made sense of as a, as a particular, a single run in the interpreter. So uh, it's just a style of coding since I'm writing in a single script and not in a, um, in a Jupyter notebook. Okay. Cause I was, I was going to say, I'd never used that. I just, uh, it may be just because it was, was with spider. I just put main in parentheses and magic occurred. Yes. So that, that was the Python environment helping you out um, as an IDE. Okay. And so there's nothing, um, nothing magic about this. It's just a way to write a, a program in a single, a single script. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this to our server in case you want to look at it. Try not to give you too much because I want you to do some noggin dunking. Um, Python scripts playground icon demo. Okay, so then let's so we're gonna have a sequence of characters hard coded in, right? I would start with the hard code, get that to work, and then you can think about a function that reads it from the user. Start with the absolute simplest case of not having to worry about user input first. Okay. If you it, then you have to start dealing with what if they enter weird stuff and there's a bunch of validation that you'll have to do to make a good user input. So starting with something like just having a the hard coded list is a good good way to start. Okay, and that, when you say that start that, you mean like that's what we're working with this week? Yeah. Okay. Um, and we're gonna be picking out like a um, icon in that get list. Yeah, we'll 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 play with them. If you want, uh, I gave you 
uh, there's a link at the, I'll put it in the mod for the icons. There's that uh, directory that has a few sample icons in it that you could play with. Um, or better yet, you could make your own, um, your own icon. So this is sample looping script. So this is the broken, this is uh, in process. All right, so if you want to get at that script, that's in our module. Hit reload, remember F5 is your friend. So here's the sample icons. That's not in the schedule, no. It's in the module, the icon manipulation module. Right here. What? Oh, man. Uh... Are you having trouble finding it? Uh, yeah, sometimes it's just a little difficult for me to um, navigate. So icon module and then sample looping script. Okay, found that. Okay. If you have ideas for helping improve navigation, I'm open to all of this. That's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's not a good sound. <laughs> okay. I think it's, um, we've also been ha whacking at this for uh, for three hours. So um, as you think about it, feel free to give me a call. Uh, if you want to talk through stuff, we can do a quick screen share. Um, I want you to start playing with loops, and playing with some of those data structures, and have something shareable next time. Um, we'll introduce. Um, let's see what do we what do we have up for next week? We'll introduce JSON um, as a potential way of encoding your icon, and we'll see how far people got. Um, my sense would be, if you're looking for ballpark kind of stuff, is like three hours or something between now and next week. Okay. That's so a couple of questions I have about this script. Um, for positive or pause in range zero to three, print the value of that's that's in B sequence and end it with a nothing. Is that no nothing in, in those quotes? Yep. So don't put a new line at the end of the printing. Ah, and then print. What's that R? That is the Linux for uh, carriage return, uh, meaning typewriter carriage goes to the beginning of the line oh, yeah. without oh, an extra enter. Is that different from N? Uh, it is different from N on Linux. Every uh, The operating system, so Windows decided that their next line includes the full typewriter. So in a typewriter, the carriage has to go back and then the paper has to go up. So the invisible character is L and uh, F, carriage return and line feed. In Linux, it's just line feed. There's no mm. carriage return. So that's, that's why there's a different character that I had to use on my and my shell. OK. So we're trying to get the, to print out a, a whole picture of what we're doing before the end of next week or before next week get it to print something out okay excuse uh, me <coughs> where is the link for the icon samples please uh it's at the very top of the module page for icon manipulation so i'll show you here so here's our schedule icon manipulation module it's also the same link as this and so then there's sample icons, sample looping script, and then a link down to these two areas. All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, and again, this is this 
week is a chance for me to see what you come back with, where your Python is. Um, if you find yourself in a beat your head against the wall situation, stop, walk away, get some ice cream, uh, and uh, and take go back to the book and look at some of the fundamentals on looping or string processing. Uh, that's my suggestion. All right, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you questions regarding the real code itself, like moving forward, like what the good practice is, I guess? Yep. Um, sorry, I think I just lost where it was. I don't know how. Um, Jesus, come on. And if you're all set, you know, feel free to sign off. I took a screenshot of the participant list for attendance. Okay. Um, so this is going to be basically if I'm kind of expanding on what you did. It's kind of like, so it's, it's going to be a list of lists. It could be. Okay. Remember if it's a list of lists, it's a little, it's, you're not, you don't have to manage your cursor with a separate set of variables. You just have to have a loop that loops over your outer list and then a loop that loops over your inner list. Yes, okay. Whereas what I tinkered with here unsuccessfully was the idea of, a, of an unbroken list and then I have a separate variable that stores how long my lines should be. They're both legitimate approaches. Stores how long your line should be. Yeah, the three. So I was trying to get a three by three matrix. So I have row size equals three um, as a way of controlling how many times I print before I go to the next line. Okay. What, what aspect of this repeated the made it go three times, the range zero to three, row size equals three. Yeah, so the, the, what, I, what I've given you is not the working model. I've given you a broken model. Okay. But I want you to figure it out for yourself. Yeah, okay. But the idea of having nested loops and thinking about, um, where you do the breaking, those are useful starting spots. Yeah, okay. Okay. I have faith in you, Mr. Wartman. Thanks. <laughs> Start tinkering with it and figure out what's going on. Yeah. All right. I don't have any questions currently. I'm just waiting to see if anybody else does. Hey, Eric, can you hear me now? Yes, that's a firm. You can hear me better than before? Absolutely. I was wondering if you could... Oh, we just lost you. So how about now? Oh, good. Okay. I was wondering if we could do a screen share and if you could help me at some point, like after everyone drops off. Yep. Okay, Absolutely. thanks. Uh, I just turned on participant sharing. So if, does anyone else have uh, questions for me or the group? No, thank you. Thank you. It's been, been a good long night. Yep, see you next week. Yep, cheers. Bye. Jill, Paul, anything I can help with before I jump in with Rob? It looks like... No, nothing. It, it looks like the link... Uh, did you just put that up because yes. when I'm, okay, maybe it's not updated. It's F5. not, I need to refresh your browser or something. Hit F5. I already did that, but it's not showing up. I don't know why. Let me see. Oh. Again, please. Mm -hmm. The other thing to try is hit F12 first and then hit F5. That will force your browser to not use a cached copy. Do 
Ben, with your black background, it seems like you're on a stage and you're ready to give a monologue. Uh, <laughs> pretty, it's pretty great. So have you acted? Are you an actor? Actress? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 and I definitely don't play one either. <laughs> Is it coming through, Paul? I'm trying to take a look at it now. One second. What what I'm really interested in is the output. I want to take a look at the output of all just stu other students to make sure about you know what you what you are really looking for. So okay, maybe I can get a um, maybe I should give you a sample output. Let's try to find one. All right, I will, let's do this. This is gonna be fun. Okay, let me do a screen share. When, when I'm clicking on the link, it's not, it's just taking me to the initial exercise, you know, um, the actual, you know, project and requirement okay. and stuff. It's not taking me to the other page where I can, you know, take a look at the output of other students. So. Uh, because I haven't given you output, I've only given you sample icons. I'm working mm -hmm. on uh, sample output right now. Um, Oh, uh, Brandon. This tent. Okay. Uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> There. That's that's a sample output. Let's try it again. So uh, you're okay. running it from the command line, huh? Yeah. Uh, a whole number. Let's scale it to five. Okay. Uh, invert. Yes. Okay, so that's a scaled. Okay. So if you look at it really small, scale it, no scaling. So you can see that basic process. Yes. Let's. Um, I'm gonna screenshot that. I'm a little familiar with Jupyter Notebook, so you okay if I'm using that? Yeah, that's the way I to can, go. That's I the can, way to go. Yeah, I can, you know, work individually on each cell and, you know, display the output. Yeah, I just wanted to give people, uh, I haven't installed it yet on this computer. I was in the process and it took like an hour to download. So I was just using what I had available, but I'll generally be using um, Jupyter. Okay.
Sounds good. It's useful to try both because sometimes you'll get scripts that aren't in Jupyter and it's, you just want to run them as Python. Um, okay. So I'm going to put this uh, sample output. Let's do this. Got a little one there with you. I have a, I had a baby girl about oh. uh, a month and a half ago. Wow. Oh, <laughs> so congratulations. Great. Thank you. So my 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 summer was really hectic. I bet. <laughs> really, really hectic. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I have a lot of respect for parenting because I am far from that land. Um, it scares me to death, quite honestly. Um, okay, so now there's your sample. Okay. Uh, let me. I can make it even better. ID. And then we'll make an index up here. Okay, so now if you refresh that, uh, sample is linked right there. 